Just a couple of introductory notes before I read the passage and we pray. Uh, the first is this, uh, that the song, songs of ascent, Psalm 120 through 134, were traditionally sung as pilgrims went to Jerusalem for worship. And so these psalms, as we look at them, were sung, as all of the psalms were, and they were sung in worship, in preparation for worship, and in a myriad of different circumstances as those going to Jerusalem sought to use them. Uh, secondly, I am not preaching through them in the order in which we find them within our, our canon of Scripture. Don't worry, that's okay. Uh, we are going to look at them in different orders, uh, also thematically, and uh, Lord willing, I'll preach through each of these psalms uh, as we have them. So, as a church, we have been in the practice of memorizing Psalm 121. And uh, some of you uh, may have chosen not to participate, but I know, because you've told me, a number of you uh, have chosen to either memorize uh, the uh, version that's translated in the English Standard Version, or you've memorized the uh, Psalter version, which we will sing at the conclusion of this service. And you may be uh, in the process of memorizing this. Keep going. You can do this. You can memorize this psalm. And, and as the video that our, our church released this week, uh, as a reminder, you know that the more that you focus on it and repeat it, that you're going to move from short-term memory to long-term memory. And I have to ask you, how beautiful would it be for you to get to the end of 2022 and say, you know, I know that psalm. I know it backwards and forwards. And I have committed it to my memory. Well, that would be a beautiful thing. And so I encourage you, keep on keeping on and memorizing this psalm. And so let's look at it together. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So let's go to him dependently in prayer. Gracious God of all grace, make your word a swift word, passing from ear to heart, from the heart to the lip and conversation, that as the rain returns not empty, so neither may your word but accomplish that for which it is given. In Jesus' name, amen. I would imagine I, uh, like you, uh, have lived most of my life in a river valley. But I love the mountains. It's not just the air but it's also the views of and from the mountains. As the altitude rises, my family will tell you, so does my mood. <laughs> and seemingly, I, I just come alive in the alpine air. It's no surprise that gazing upon Pike's Peak in 1893, Catherine Lee Bates wrote of Purple Mountain Majesty in her song, America the Beautiful. There is indeed a majesty to mountains, which rightly directed should lead us to worship the maker of mountains. As the psalmist sings in Psalm 90, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Mountaintop moments show up 
all throughout Scripture. It was upon a mountain that God first appeared to Moses. It was upon a mountain that God made the Noahic and the Mosaic covenants. It was upon a mountain that God's temple was constructed, leading the sons of Korah to sing, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. And you may recall that our Lord Jesus went up upon a mountain to pray. So mountains have more than just a picturesque part in the redemptive plan of God. But there is also, there is also in all of us a temptation to look to the mountains for more. This is certainly the case in Israel's history. You think about the unorthodox and adulterated places of worship that were erected upon the high hills of Israel. For example, young King Ahaz, the king of Judah, began when he began his reign, he went not to the Lord's temple to worship. Do you remember where he went? He went up to the, quote, high places on the high hills, bringing offerings and making sacrifices. Ahaz even burned his own son as a sacrificial offering to pagan gods. And it's through the book of Kings that we read over and over and over again that the high places were not torn down through good kings and bad. It's hard to tear down what the people have grown to accept and love. So high places became mountain high shrines. Shrines of pleasurable promiscuity. Promised provision, promised prosperity, and even promised protection. Even the faithful child of Israel could be tempted to diversify. Think about the life of Solomon. Trusting the Lord, but sharing, well, sharing the love with an orgy of gods. It would seem that there has always been the temptation. Why not? Lift up your eyes to the hills. From there comes your help. Or as one poet translates it, Up to those bright and gladsome hills whence flow my will and mirth. You see, it's it's easy. It's easy to forget the one who made heaven and earth when a mountaintop experience is promised. And so as we consider this psalm, and perhaps you consider this yourself as in memorizing this psalm, ask yourself, from where does my help come? Is it to the elevated yet adulterated places of promise? Do I look elsewhere for help? Is it to work? Is it to family? Is it to the world that you look For help. I think Calvin captured the problem when he said, The thoughts of the godly, that would be us, the thoughts of the godly are never so stayed upon the word of God as not to be carried away at the first impulse to some allurements, and especially when dangers disquiet us, or when we are assailed with sore temptations, It is scarcely possible for us from our so being inclined to the earth not to be moved by the enticements presented to us until our minds put a bridle upon themselves and turn them back to God. And I think Calvin's right. I think that is is our temptation and we are all susceptible to it as uh, Calvin puts it when our hearts are disquieted. When trouble arises... We are tempted to look to someone else or something else. Such as the allure to look up to the hills for everything but God. The high high places offer you the world. But like those elevated pagan shrines, high places promises cannot be 
kept like the ashes of Ahaz's son. The world delivers nothing but loss. And so the psalmist tells us this simple truth. The Lord helps you. The Lord helps you. The psalmist puts the mountains in their mindful place, confessing, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. When we look up to the hills, when we gaze at the beautiful mountains, we should think of their maker. To think otherwise is to place our faith in creation over its creator. To confess belief in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, is more than a statement of divine creation. When we confess that, we are declaring God's sovereignty over the heavenly realms and the earthly realms. He who created all things, He who ordains whatsoever comes to pass, who reigns in majesty over heaven and earth, is not a pagan God on high places. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. I hope that you notice the distinction in reading and memorizing this psalm. The psalmist uses here the Hebrew word for God's covenant name, Yahweh which in our English translations are capitalized with a capital L, a capital O, a capital R, a capital D. That is a good translation and rightly translated borrowing from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which did the exact same thing. The Lord, as it is translated in English, is the covenant name of God, of Yahweh. And it implies He is God, but it also uh, implies a relationship. When God revealed himself to Moses, he explained the meaning of that self-revealed name. He said, in essence, it would be like us saying, Yahweh means, God said, I am who I am. I am who I am. His revelation was clear. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. And he who eternally is, the one and only true God, he chose to reveal himself to his covenant people, in covenant with them. He is not only God, he is the Lord of his chosen people. Of course, on this side of the cross, we know the fuller revelation, the fulfillment of Jesus Christ as Lord. We know that God's covenant people are comprised of a people made up of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. All those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we consider the Lord's help, that our help comes from Him, You could say that we understand it holistically. He who redeemed us by his blood has won us heart, body, and soul. 17th century poet George Herbert captures this truth beautifully in his poem of Psalm 23 when he says, The God of love my shepherd is, and he that doth me feed. While, I, while he is mine and I am his, what can I want or need? And so it is the Lord, our Lord, who helps, and him alone. But the psalmist refers, and this is important, he refers to him as our keeper. The Lord is our keeper. The Lord keeps you. This is a theme that the psalmist repeats Consistently. Look at the text with me. Look at Psalm 121 with me. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Same Hebrew word. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. 
the same Hebrew word is used six times. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted you to memorize this psalm, because when you memorize it, instead of just reading it, you go, wow, that's a lot of keeps. The keeps keeping on, right? The repetition is not coincidental. We are to hear the psalmist repeat this word, and it is supposed to mean something, right? This word may also be translated as watches over. It can also be translated as guards. The word that's translated keeper could be translated as he who watches over, or we could say he is our guardian. But I really like the translation of keep and keeper. And the reason is, is it reminds me so much of Psalm 23. The shepherd imagery of being kept. He leads me to the tender grass where I both feed and rest. Then to the streams that gently pass and both I have the best. Or if I stray, he doth convert and bring my mind and frame. And none of this for my desert but for his holy name. The Lord our God is indeed our keeper and we are kept safely as his flock. Drawing from the imagery of ascent within this psalm, the psalmist employs, well, he employs a mountain climbing metaphor, doesn't he? He talks about our foothold. He will not let your foot be moved. And you think about this metaphorically, the Christian life is a journey. We see this theme repeated within the New Testament. Our faith is often referred to as walking. And sometimes our footing may, as this Hebrew word could be understood, sometimes our footing can lead us to totter or to stumble along. It should not surprise us then when we encounter, if I may carry this metaphor a little further, it it shouldn't surprise us when we encounter washed out trails, loose gravel, even ledges of unstable shale, all of which can make us wonder in our lives, am I on the right path? Surely I'm not on the right path if I encounter troubles. (laughs) Will I fall along the way? The psalmist pushes back against this fear, and we've all had the fear before, and he says, your foot will not be moved. The Lord will not let it happen. The Lord will not let your foot be moved God does not promise you a problem-free life. Hmm. Actually, quite the opposite if we listen to the words of Jesus, right? But he does promise us that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. And so we are taught from Deuteronomy chapter 31 all the way to the words of Christ in the Gospels, do not fear or be dismayed. Of course, the psalmist's metaphorical use of foot doesn't just mean foot, right? It encompasses all of our lives, all of us. We are not to fear. Why? Why are we not to fear? Because our footing is sure. In fact, there is never a time for the child of God when you were not kept. There was never a time when He is not keeping you, watching over you. He who keeps you will not slumber. But the same thing cannot be said about you. And it can't be said about me either, can it? We need sleep. In fact, we have to have it. God created us that way. I love the way the psalmist puts it. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. The Lord keeps you better than you keep yourself. And the Lord does not require sleep. God gives us sleep as a gift, but our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. And it's not just you personally, 
But the Lord is faithful to keep all of his covenant children in Christ. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The poetic repetition here of slumbering and sleep is to emphasize its certainty. He's not stuttering. He's not looking to repeat two words that mean the same thing. He's emphasizing the certainty of God's provision. He who rested on the seventh day after creation did not do so because of fatigue. He did not do so out of necessity, but to signify the completion of creation, to establish a rhythm of work and rest and worship for us. He who is worthy of our worship leads us not to rest in ourselves. That should be the warning, right? When I'm trusting in me, when I'm staying awake, I'm fighting sleep because you know, God, you need me. No, he doesn't. He who neither slumbers nor sleeps is our keeper. Of course, the world, the flesh, and the devil, you know those three, right? The world and the flesh and the devil, they want you to believe differently. The world wants us to think that it is always on. 24-7 headline news, right? Always plugged in. Always going. You know, that's a big fat lie. You know that, right? Because the world's made up of people just like you who require sleep. And so, we're all dependent upon God's provision and His common grace. The world wants you to think it's open for business 24-7. It's not. Our flesh would have us believe that the worldly worries, those worldly cares, those worldly burdens are ours like one big backpack to strap on and carry up life's mountain. Just climbing up life's mountain. We might even include some religious terminology, right? Well, I'm doing this for Jesus. Just climbing, carrying all my burdens with me all the way up life's mountain. Nope. And the devil. The devil. That that old deceiver. He seeks to replicate. Then duplicate. To emulate. Ultimately to desecrate the truth of God. Lift up your eyes to the hills. It's up there. You see? That's where your help is. Upward. Outward. Inward. Anywhere but looking to God. But it's all a lie. And one of my favorite scenes in Scripture is when Elijah is confronting the prophets of Baal. And it's a great passage, isn't it? And you remember what he said? Prophets of Baal are cutting themselves, screaming out loud. They're doing all of these things because, well, their God, who is no God, is not doing what they expect him to do. And Elijah, this is one of my favorite parts because it's sarcasm in the Bible, right? He's really sarcastic here. And he backs up and he says, cry aloud. Didn't you say he was a God? Either he is musing or he's relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. As if to say, where's your God today? Did he take a bathroom break? Take a little nap? No. The God who sleeps is no God at all. But the one true God never sleeps, never slumbers, always keeping, always watching, even when the experiences of your life lead you to think, where is God in this? That's just you. He is always, always watching over and keeping you. That we are kept by God also implies protection. The Lord protects you. Describing our divine protection, the psalmist employs the metaphors of sun and moon, day and night. The Lord is a shade against harm on your right hand, which is a Semitic expression that means trust. You can trust God. 
He is your shade. He is your protection. And His protection shields us against the sun by day and the antithetical parallel of the moon by night. In other words, there is never a moment in your 24-hour day whether the sun is up or the moon, there's never a moment in your day that your keeper does not watch over and protect you, not just for today, but forever. Although less obvious in our English translation, and continuing to use the verb keep, in verse 7, the psalmist shifts to what's called the imperfect mood. Now, you who know me, you are now thinking, you nerd. Why are you telling me about the imperfect mood in the Hebrew passage here? Well, if you're not thinking that, my wife is. But bear with me. And here, this is why it's very important. And it doesn't show up in English. The reason is, the psalmist has now, up until this point, been teaching us what God does. Now, by changing the mood of that verb, he now tells us what he does and will do forever. It's a continuing note. He keeps us. In Hebrew, this shift tells us God does this for you and God does this for you forever. The Lord's protection is not merely momentary. As if sometimes you could say, well, I know the Lord was watching out for me then, but I'm not sure about tomorrow. I'm sure. You'd be sure. There's never a moment when He is not keeping you. He is always keeping you. And if you don't feel like He's keeping you, He's keeping you. Right? The Lord is on my side. He declares, I will not fear what can man do to me. George Herbert wrote, Yea, in death's shady black abode, may, well, may I walk not fear, for thou art with me and thy rod to guide thy staff to bear. Indeed, our sovereign Lord keeps us in his care. Whether it be in his provision in temptation. Whether it be endurance through trials. Or whether it just be in the simple trust in him that you and I need day by day. And he has armed us with his Ordinary means of grace, His word, His sacraments, and prayer. That we may live from beginning to end in Him and through Him. He who keeps you will keep you from, we might say, from cradle to grave unto eternity. He keeps us. And the psalmist teaches us to think about this. And, and I find that, that oftentimes we think about the beginning of the psalm as sort of the, the main introductory point. But he now includes in this last stanza of this poem something to emphasize this. And oftentimes it's missed. He teaches us to think of this in the practical imagery of a work day. Just an ordinary day. In an agricultural, agri agrarian economy, He's just pointing us to the everyday life. And you know it. And I know it. The start of the day. And the end of the day. You're going out. And you're coming in. In the morning. The laborer would go out the gate of the city. Would go out into the fields. And would work all day in the fields. At the end of the day. The worker would come into the city. Within the safety of the walls. And the gate of that city. But the question that we should ask ourselves is, who watches over the worker when he's out in the field? Who takes care of her who is out there working? Think about the example of Ruth and Boaz. As God used Boaz to watch over Ruth, and yet she's out there in the field working. You and I, in our everyday experiences, Encounter troubles and trials, often heartache, and all of the complexities of life. And yet, and yet, our God is watching over us. When we go outside the gate into the day of life, 
when we come back inside the city, he watches over us and protects us. Nay, thou dost make me sit and dine, even in my enemy's sight. My head with oil, my cup with wine runs over day and night. He who made heaven and earth, he who neither slumbers nor sleeps, he shields us both day and night from harm. He is the Lord who will keep you from this time forth and forevermore. For Christ our Lord and Keeper has redeemed us. He has saved us from our enemies of sin and death. He has given us life by His Holy Spirit and He has guaranteed us eternal life in His kingdom. We do not look outward to the hills. We do not look inward to ourselves, but we look to Christ alone, for Christ is our keeper forevermore. Surely thy sweet and wondrous love shall measure all my days, and as it never shall remove, so neither shall my praise. Let's pray. Our great God, you are our Lord and Keeper. And as we have sung the psalm together, and the reading and preaching of the word, and as we prepare to sing it together as a psalter, we pray that you would remind us by your Holy Spirit the truth of this. And when we are tempted to look to the world, to trust in our flesh, to give way to the temptations that the devil has put in our path, pray that you would remind us that's not where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. May we always trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.